The unfinished business is a request for a recorded vote on amendment number four printed in the House Report 112-267 by the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Thompson, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the nays prevail by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number four printed in House Report number 112-267 offered by Mr. Thompson of Mississippi. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members record their votes by electronic device. This will be a two-minute vote. And it's the second of five amendment votes on the Coast Guard reauthorization bill. This amendment by Benny Thompson of Mississippi would add a new section to the bill to open admissions to the U.S. Coast Guard Academy to eligible candidates nominated by Congress. A two-minute vote. There will be three more uh, amendment votes ahead. And the, House, the House won't finish work on this Coast Guard bill. They will pick it up again when they return from their, from their break next week. They're off next week for their district work period. The Senate is in session next week, and the Associated Press reports that Senate Democrats have scheduled votes next week on two bipartisan proposals to boost job growth. They say that unlike previous attempts to pass President Obama's jobs agenda, next week's votes seem likely to succeed. One bill would give $4,800 to businesses that hire an, employed veteran, an unemployed veteran, and the companies would get $9,600 for hiring an injured vet. The, uh, speaking of unemployment, the numbers did come out today for October. The unemployment rate dropping to 9% with the Labor Department saying that uh, 80,000 jobs were added in October. As usual, the Joint Economic Committee met on the day that the numbers announced. We covered that earlier, and we'll show it to you later in our program schedule. On this vote, the ayes are 182, the nays are 218. The amendment is not adopted. Chair reminds members that we are planning on having two-minute votes for the remainder of these. The unfinished business is a request for a recorded vote on amendment number six, printed in the House Report 112-267 by the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Napolitano, on which further proceedings were postponed, on which the nays prevail by a voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number six, printed in House Report number 112-267, offered by Mrs. Napolitano of California. Recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. Sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their vote by electronic device. This is a two-minute vote. The underlying measure reauthorizes Coast Guard programs and policies. These are amendment votes. Grace Napolitano's amendment would give tuna vessels in the western Pacific Ocean the option of using Guam as their required port of call 
in order to meet U.S. maritime regulations. Congresswoman Napolitano's California colleague, Representative Laura Richardson, says the House, House Ethics Committee has named a panel to investigate whether she improperly used her staff for political purposes. In a statement today, Representative Richardson said the committee unfairly singled her out because she's an African American, while ignoring other lawmakers who may have used their misused their congressional staffs. On this boat, the A's are 363, the nays. 
Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield voted aye. Mr. Rivera. Mr. Rivera votes aye. On this vote, the yeas are 364, the nays are 37. The amendment is adopted. The end business is the request for a recorded vote on amendment number seven printed in the House report. 1126-267 by the gentleman from New York, Mr. Bishop, on which further proceedings were postponed and which the nays prevailed by a voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number seven, printed in House Report number 112-267, offered by Mr. Bishop of New York. Recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for recorded vote will rise and be counted. A sufficient number having risen. Recorded vote is ordered. Members record their vote by electronic device. This will be a two-minute attempt. Congressman uh, Tim Bishop's amendment to the Coast Guard bill would provide states the authority to impose more protective operational requirements on the discharge of ballast water within state resource waters. This is another two-minute vo vote. One more amendment vote after this, and the House won't finish up work on the Coast Guard bill this week. They're off next week for their district work period. The Associated Press reports this afternoon that Representative Gabrielle Giffords vows to return to Congress in a new book that details the months of intense therapy and her battle to come to terms with what happened after the shooting in Tucson. They write the book titled uh, Gabby, a, Cur a Story of Courage and Hope is set for release on November 15th. The Associated Press purchased an advanced copy. It is a book written by her former husband, her husband, former astronaut Mark Kelly, but she has the last chapter in it, a single page of short sentences and phrases entitled Gabby's Voice. Gabrielle Giffords was on the floor of the House in August, August 1st, during the debt ceiling vote. Ms. Captor. Off eye on no for Ms. Captor. Mr. McIntyre. Mr. McIntyre votes aye. The ayes are 174, the nays are 225, the, mo the amendment is not adopted. The amendment, the unfinished business is the request for a recorded vote. Amendment number eight printed in the House Report 1126267.
I'm sorry, 112-267 by the gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Slaughter, which further proceedings were postponed, on which the nays prevail by a voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number eight, printed in the House Report, number 112-267, offered by Ms. Slaughter of New York. Recorder vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorder vote will rise and be counted. A sufficient number having risen, recorder vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This also is a two-minute vote. And it's likely the uh, last recorded vote of the week for the U.S. House. This is another one dealing with the um, state's regulation of the discharge of ballast water. The underlying bill is the Coast Guard reauthorization bill and the House will complete work on this bill that when they return from their week off a week from Monday. The Senate does return next week and you can follow Senate debate on C-SPAN 2 of course. On C-SPAN 2 this evening road to the White House coverage. We're in Des Moines for the 2011 uh, Ronald Reagan dinner. Five presidential candidates will be there. Rick Perry, former House Speaker Newt Gingrich, Michelle Bachman, Ron Paul and former U.S. Senator Rick Santorum. That gets underway at 8 o'clock Eastern, live on C-SPAN 2. On this vote, the yeas are 161, the nays are 237. The amendment is not adopted. Time's up. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey rise? Mr. Chairman, I move the committee do now rise. Questions on the motion that the committee rise. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted according to the committee rises.
The chair of the committee of the whole house on the State of the Union reports that the committee that that committee has had under consideration H.R. 2838 and has come to no resolution thereon. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on H.R. 2838. Objection. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? I send a, to the desk a concurrent resolution and ask unanimous consent for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the title of the concurrent resolution. House Concurrent Resolution 86, concurrent resolution directing the clerk of the House of Representatives to make corrections in the enrollment of H.R. 2061. Is there objection to the consideration of the concurrent resolution? Without objection, the concurrent resolution is agreed to and the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask for unanimous consent to take from the Speaker's table the bill S-1487 and ask the House for its immediate consideration in the House. The clerk will report the title of the bill. Senate 1487, an act to authorize the Secretary of Homeland Security in coordination with the Secretary of State to establish a program to issue Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation business travel cards and for other purposes. Is there objection to the consideration of the bill? Without objection, the bill is read a third time and passed, and the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Ryan, be permitted to revise and extend his remarks and insert extraneous materials into the record. Without objection, so ordered. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask for unanimous consent that, one, when the House adjourns today, it adjourned to meet at 10 a.m. on Monday, November 7, 2011. Two, when the House adjourns on that day, it adjourned to meet at 2.30 p.m. on Thursday, November 10, and three, when the House adjourns on that day, it adjourned to meet at 2 p.m. on Monday, November 14. Without objection, so ordered. So I read all of it. The chair announces the speaker's appointment pursuant to section 1002 of the Intelligence Authorization Act for fiscal year 2003. PL 107-306 as amended by section 701A3 of the Intelligence Authorization Act for fiscal year 2010 PL 111-259 and the order of the House of January 5, 2011 of the following member of the House to the National Commission for the Review of the Research and Development Programs of the United States Intelligence Community. Mr. Conaway of Texas. The House will be in order. Members, please take your conversations off the floor. The chair is prepared to entertain one minute requests. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? Without objection, so ordered. Be in order. Members, please take your conversations off the floor.
Gentleman may proceed. Madam Speaker, on October 9, 2011, a good friend and longtime scouter, John Milton Kreiner II, passed away at the age of 53. A life marked with accomplishment and overcoming barriers. John was born in 1958 with Down syndrome. Despite life's challenges, John and his parents, John and Betta, always focused on the possible, not the limitations. He graduated from State College Area High School and went on to receive certification from Center County Vocational in the Hiram G. Hiram G. Andrews Technical Schools and was later employed by the State College Area School District. A member of Troop 339, Boy Scouts of America, John received the Eagle Scout with Gold Palm, Silver Beaver Award, Unit Commissioner, Honorary Camp Director, and Wood Badge Beaver Awards. He attended four BSA National Jamborees serving as a staff member was a vigil honor member of the Monacan Lodge or the Arrow and an honorary member of Penn State University's Alpha Phi Omega. John was a member of the Grace Lutheran Church where he served as usher, greeter, and a member of the Disciples Sunday School class. He was also a state Special Olympic silver, bronze, and gold medal winner in swimming. John Kreiner was a true inspiration to all who knew him. Well done, Scouter. And I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Request permission to address the House for one minute. Without objection, so ordered. Madam Speaker, during the hot days of summer, the veterans of foreign wars went to battle with the Veterans Administration. The VFW claimed the VA was censoring free speech and preventing the free exercise of religion at the National Cemetery in Houston. The VFW says the chapel at the cemetery was closed. The Bible, the cross, the Star of David were removed, and the chapel became a storage shed. VFW members also said the director of the cemetery censored prayers and prohibited the religious ceremony during the burial of veterans. The VFW sued the VA, and the VA naturally denied the whole thing. Recently, a federal judge approved and agreed to an order requiring the chapel to be reopened, the Bible, the cross, the Star of David to be returned, and said that the VA must not interfere with free speech or the free exercise of religion at burials. Madam Speaker, it is ironic that Americans have gone to war, fought for the principles of the Constitution. Then when they come home, they face a government that is hostile and the denial of First Amendment rights to the citizens when these veterans are buried in VA cemeteries. Now the veterans have won a battle against the government that wanted to deny them the American freedoms they fought for in lands far, far away. And that's just the way it is. I yield back. Gentlemen's time's expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Nebraska rise? To address the House for one minute. Without objection, so ordered. Madam Speaker, the Department of Health and Human Services recently proposed a rule that would require all health plans to cover in full and consequently every American to subsidize procedures and drugs that are unrelated to medical necessity, traditionally considered electives, and, and that can be very ethically divisive for many Americans. Why, when 75 cents on every public health care dollar is spent on the management of chronic conditions, such as cancer, or heart disease, and stroke, is the Health and Human Services Department prioritizing free sterilization, for instance, this is distinctly unrelated to our nation's priority health care challenges. I can only conclude that this is ideologically driven and most perniciously affects faith-based institutions who are the backstop of compassionate and good care for the poor and vulnerable in society. Many Republicans and Democrats have expressed very serious concerns about this. No American should be forced to choose between their faith and their job. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from North Dakota rise? Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, with each new overreaching one-size-fits-all mandate, the Obama administration continues to burden the states with unnecessary costs and regulations that are hindering job creation. That's why today I introduce the Regional Hayes Federalism Act. This will rein in the Obama administration and prevent a federal takeover of state Hayes management. States like North Dakota continue to act responsibly to create well-researched plans and to implement EPA-mandated policies. Yet it's clear that these efforts to play by the rules aren't enough for the Obama administration. 
the administration's overreach would cost North Dakota over $700 million. Those costs will directly increase rates to our consumers across the state. If we are truly committed to creating jobs and lowering energy costs, we need to empower the states and rein in President Obama's overreaching EPA. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield the remainder of my time. Gentlemen's time has expired. Are there further requests for one minute? The chair lays before the House the following personal requests. Leaves of absence requested for Mr. Danny Davis of Illinois for today, Mr. Heinrich of New Mexico for today, and Mr. Jones of North Carolina for today after 11.30 a.m. Without objection, the requests are granted. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5th, 2011, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Andrews, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the Minority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I appreciate this opportunity. I'd like to thank the, the members of the House staff that are staying beyond voting hours for uh, our opportunity to speak, and I promise I will reward your uh, efforts with brevity. Um, this is uh, the end of another difficult week for a lot of Americans. For too many Americans, it's another week without a paycheck. For many Americans, this is the week that their unemployment benefits expire and they will have no income next week. For many Americans, this is the last weekend they'll be in their home because the foreclosure is about to be executed upon. And sadly, for so many Americans, this might be the last time that he or she closes the doors on their business. This time they close it for good. Our constituents and neighbors are hurting, hurting desperately. And I think there's been far too little attention paid to those problems here in this institution. I hope that when we return after, parenthetically, what is our 12th recess of the year, uh, we will get to work on the jobs problem for our country and try to put our people back to work. As vital as that jobs crisis is, we can never put our country in a situation we are, where we are not paying attention to threats to our security here at home and around the world. And I do want to spend a few moments this afternoon talking about what I think is a very significant threat, and that is the threat of Iran developing a nuclear weapon. It is to the credit of the chairwoman of the International Relations Committee, Foreign Affairs Committee, Ms. Ross Leitonen, and the senior Democrat ranking member, Mr. Berman, that yesterday Republicans and Democrats on that committee came together to pass what I consider to be very powerful legislation that would work against the propagation of nuclear weapons by Iran. And I think that legislation is something that I hope will be brought to the floor promptly and supported by members from both sides. I think it's important to understand what more we could do and why it's so important to do it. This is another productive day throughout our country. People are going to work in our cities and our small towns and our suburbs. They're going to classes at universities and schools. They're visiting their loved ones in hospitals. It is, thank God, a normal day in America where we can do the things that we want to do. But you know, a day 10 years ago in September of 2001 started like a normal day too. September 11, 2001 was a beautiful blue sky crystalline day and it ended as one of the worst days in the history of our country. And the pain of that day is felt by people around this country, not just in the New York metropolitan region, not just in Washington DC, not just in Pennsylvania, but around the country and around the world. I fear and dread that a similar day could come from a scenario almost too terrible to imagine. Imagine a group of terrorists who are able to assemble a substantial amount of money, but not an impossible amount of money. Let's say about two million dollars. And they're able to commandeer the services of scientists who are evil enough or hungry enough that they would lend their skills to the destructive task of making a small nuclear device, what we call a small improvised explosive device, a nuclear IED. 
And they don't need a missile to deliver this nuclear IED. They need a U-Haul truck. So they assemble the IED, and they load it on the back of a U-Haul truck, and they drive it to a place where there's a lot of innocent Americans, the Capitol Mall right outside of this building, a sports arena for an NFL football game, Times Square, a church or a synagogue or a mosque where people are about to worship and they detonate the nuclear IED, the consequences are huge numbers of deaths in the immediate area of the explosion, a significant number of people sickened and eventually dying from nuclear poisoning, the contamination of the area of the explosion, and a devastating blow to the psyche of the United States of America. How could this happen? Is this possible? Well, it's possible only if terrorists get access to what's called fissile material from which you could make a nuclear bomb. Fissile material can only come from three places. You can make it, and it takes a very significant industrial complex to do so. You can steal it. That's a problem that we're working on trying to prevent. Or you can have a government that gives it to you because that government is committed to a terrorist agenda. My colleagues understand that the risk of Iranian nuclear proliferation includes firing a missile at U.S. troops or U.S. allies in the Middle East. It most certainly includes that risk, but it's not limited to that risk. I think the greatest risk of Iranian nuclear proliferation is the risk of fissile material being handed off by the Iranian government to a terrorist organization that then assembles a small nuclear IED and brings havoc and death to innocent people in the United States of America. How do we stop that? How do we prevent that from happening? That was the focus of the effort of the Foreign, Relations, Foreign Affairs Committee yesterday, and I think it should be the focus of our country and civilized countries around the world. Now, it's important to understand the, the history of this problem, the context of this problem, the risk of this problem, and what I believe is a solution to this problem. The history is this. Of all the nations in the world, only one has conducted a nuclear weapons research program and systematically lied about the fact that it's done so. And that one nation is the Republic of Iran. The source is a document from the IAEA, the International Agency that monitors nuclear development, from September 24th of 2005, when that organization said that they were uncertain of Iran's motives in failing to make important declarations over an extended period of time and in pursuing a policy of concealment until October of 2003. This is not a political view of an American legislator or an ideological position of a journal. This is the official statement from the international agency that watches nuclear weapons. That's the history, a long history of deceit and concealment. What's the context? How is Iran behaving in the present state of world affairs? First of all, they're killing United States troops in Iraq. Here's what the State Department's 2010 country terrorism report had to say about Iran. Despite its pledge to support the stabilization of Iraq, Iranian authorities continue to provide lethal support, including weapons, training, funding, and guidance to Iraqi Shia militant groups that target U.S. and Iraqi forces. This is a country that's actively engaged in an attempt to kill American soldiers in Iraq as we speak today. Secondly, their brutality extends to their own people systematically. Let me highlight just one chilling and horrifying example reported by Amnesty International on the 11th of October of this year, of 2001. An actress named Marzea Farmer has become the latest individual to face a sentence of flogging, 
flogging. She was sentenced on or about October 8th of 2011 to a year in prison and 90 lashes. This is not the Middle Ages. I'm not reading from a historic treatise from the, the year 800. I'm reading from a, a sentence passed down by an Iranian court less than a month ago. What was her offense? Her offense was she appeared in a film called My Tehran for Sale in which she appeared in one scene without the mandatory head covering which women in Iran are required to wear and appears to drink alcohol in another. Her husband denied that she had consumed any alcohol, but the exact charge was levied. And this woman is in prison as we speak and once a month is beaten because she appeared in a movie in a way that was culturally offensive to the regime. This is the regime that is seeking a nuclear weapon. What else in, in the context? What else are they up to? Well, let's listen to the statements of the president of Iran. Now, he's not the person who really runs the country. The so-called Revolutionary Council does. But he's involved in its government, President Ahmadinejad. And here's what he said. Thanks to people's wishes and God's will, the trend for the existence of the Zionist regime is downwards. And this is what God has promised and what all nations want. Just as the Soviet Union was wiped out and today does not exist, so will the Zionist regime soon be wiped out. This is the regime that's attempting to require, acquire a nuclear weapon. And finally, we were all, I think, stunned by the reports last week that individuals who allegedly had ties to the Iranian government were indicted in the American court system for allegedly plotting the assassination of the Saudi Arabian ambassador to the United States on U.S. soil. Now, Madam Speaker, I would uh, hasten to point out, as you well know, in our system these are allegations, not facts. And so we cannot say that these things are true but I can scarcely think of a time in the history of our country where we have indicted foreign nationals or U.S. citizens for an alleged conspiracy to murder a foreign diplomat on our soil. Perhaps these individuals will be found not guilty. Perhaps they will be found guilty. But the fact that there was probable cause to make such an assertion is deeply shocking and disconcerting. This is the regime that is attempting to achieve a nuclear weapon. Now, what's, how close are they? Here's a report from May 24th of 2011. The world's global nuclear inspection industry, agency rather, the IAEA, frustrated by Iran's refusal to answer questions, revealed for the first time on Tuesday that it, meaning the UN agency that watches nuclear weapons, it possesses evidence that Tehran has conducted work on a highly sophisticated nuclear triggering technology that experts said could be used for only one purpose, setting off a nuclear weapon. This is the regime that says it is trying to acquire centrifuges and nuclear power plants to create nuclear power for its people. But the quote that I just read is from the international agency, not from U.S. intelligence not from our allies, not from those who oppose the Iranian regime, but from the neutral international agency, which frankly has criticized the United States on occasion, from the neutral international agency talking about what the Iranians are up to. Now, it's classified information as to how close they are to receiving this, and we are all under an oath not to talk about that classified information, but the public record is replete with information that the Iranians are aggressively pursuing such a weapon. And here's an academic analysis that talks about how such a weapon uh, could be used by a terrorist group that would be the beneficiary of an Iranian handoff of fissile material. Based upon this professor's analysis, and this is written by the executive director for the project on managing the atom, Jeffrey Lewis, from the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. The article is called The Economics of Nuclear Terrorism. Here's what Professor Lewis had to say. 
A terrorist organization like Al-Qaeda could plausibly build and deliver a nuclear weapon for less than $2 million. $2 million. Now, of course, that's $2 million after you've received the fissile material or bought it. Well, such an organization would now have a willing partner in Tehran that would own and be able to produce such fissile material. We have an urgent economic crisis in our country. We need to fix it. We have a lot of other problems we need to fix. But this is happening. And we cannot let our attention to our economic crisis take our attention away from our duty to prevent this kind of catastrophe from happening to innocent people in the world. So what do we do about it? What's the solution? How do we go forward in a way that stops the Iranians from getting this fissile material? To the credit of this Congress, both parties, and President Obama, the United States imposed bilateral sanctions on the Iranians about a year and a half ago. And to the credit of the United Nations Security Council, the United Nations Security Council imposed modest sanctions on the Iranians uh, about a year ago. There is some evidence that these sanctions are beginning to work. Uh, the United States sanctions, which were led by uh, then-ranking member Ross Layton, now chairwoman, and by then-chairman Berman, now ranking member, uh, and frankly that relied upon the work of Senator Kirk in the, in the Senate, focused on a gasoline uh, embargo. Um, it's an odd fact but Iran, which is a country which exports crude oil, imports about 40% of its gasoline because its economy is so dysfunctional that it cannot uh, refine its own products. Before the, before the U.S. sanctions were imposed, the price of gasoline, a gallon of gasoline heavily subsidized in Iran was 38 cents a gallon. Today it's $1.51 a gallon. Now what does this mean? It means that an Iranian citizen who used to have to work one hour to fill their gas tank once a week, now has to work five hours to fill their gas, uh, gas uh, tank once a week. This is uh, not a huge sacrifice, but it's making a dent uh, in the economy of Iran. Um, it is our intention, obviously, not to in any way punish or jeopardize the well-being of the Iranian people. They are our friends, and we want them to be our friends and allies for years to come. But the simple and, I think, compelling logic of these sanctions is we are compelling the Iranian leadership to choose between pursuing their nuclear weapons ambitions but suffering economic consequences or abandoning those nuclear weapons ambitions and having the opportunity to restore their economy to some basic degree of health. By the way, at a time when crude oil prices were rising, the Iranian economy stagnated. They had a negative growth of 1% last year and they had stagnant growth the year before that. So at a time when they should have been enjoying robust economic growth because of rising crude oil prices, they were stagnant because of the effectiveness of these sanctions. Perhaps the best evidence of effectiveness was from President Ahmadinejad himself, who this week stood before their parliament defending a cabinet member of his who was accused of some wrongdoing and, and said that one of the reasons why they had to engage in the wrongdoing was their economy was in bad shape because, quote, we can't do international banking transactions anymore, close quote. Well, there's some good news. What I'm suggesting here is that the House should move rapidly to embrace and support the legislation that the uh, Foreign Relations Committee marked up yesterday. And I think that legislation will enjoy broad uh, Republican and Democratic support, as it did yesterday. I believe it was approved unanimously by the committee. I would then urge our administration to work with the Congress and sign such legislation and implement it. Now listen, I, I, Madam Speaker, I fully understand that sanctions alone may not be sufficient. And I'm not here today to argue for that proposition. What I am here to argue today for the proposition is that the sanctions we have imposed thus far um, have shown some signs of success. And I think this is the time to intensify those sanctions, not to weaken them. I think this is a time for us to intensify our unified national resolve on this question. And despite our very profound differences on matters of economics and social policy, which is what a democracy ought to have, 
that there should be no difference between us on question of uh, standing in a unified fashion in favor of more intense sanctions against Iran. The need is urgent and compelling. You know, if, Madam Speaker, if someone had stood in this chamber in the mid-1990s and said, if we don't focus our intelligence efforts on an obscure group of former Mujahideen rebels in Afghanistan called Al-Qaeda, if we don't do that, the day may come when we will have a domestic Pearl Harbor, when the world trade centers will collapse, when thousands of people will perish, when the Pentagon, our own airspace, will be attacked by uh, civilians in our country. Uh, I think one would have thought that the member was auditioning for a Tom Clancy film. It would sound very fantastic, very unlikely, and, and almost like science fiction or a spy thriller. I wish September 11, 2001 had been fiction. I wish that we had not had to go to those funerals and comfort those families who suffer even today. I wish that were the fact. And there will be some who will say that the scenario we talked about earlier, about a nuclear IED exploding in Times Square or the National Mall or an NFL football game, is too provocative or, or too sensational or too scary. I hope they're absolutely right. I hope it's total fiction. But I think we ought to know better. I think we ought to know better that there is a regime which has demonstrated its deceit, which has manifested its evil toward its own people and to our troops in the Middle East, that has used language that is uh, more than just purple language, that's language that goes beyond the pale about the annihilation of Israel and of all those who would stand with Israel, and that now stands accused or, or persons alleged to be tied to that regime now stand accused in our courts of participating in a conspiracy to assassinate a foreign diplomat on our soil. These are people we should be concerned about. And as we look at the question of whether such an attack could happen, I think the answer is unequivocally, yes, it can. Our responsibility is to equally, with equal unequivocation, say, no, it won't. No, it won't. That we will use the resources at our disposal, our international alliances, our economic leverage, our diplomatic skill, to try to move the Iranians to the point where they would accept a reasonable deal which says if you want to have nuclear power plants in your country that's your sovereign right but you must buy your fuel from outside the country and you must abandon your ability to manufacture and synthesize fuel that's a reasonable and fair settlement we should use every tool at our disposal to encourage the Iranian government to accept such a settlement and as any wise president should do as President Obama has done, as President Bush did before him, uh, as President Clinton did before him, as President uh, Bush did before him, as President Reagan and Carter did before them. Any prudent American president must reserve the right to defend our sovereign interests with whatever tools are necessary should the need arise. I pray that the need will never arise. And I think if we act intelligently, forcefully, but urgently, I think that we can avoid that day and avoid a situation like I described earlier. So, Madam Speaker, thank you for this time this afternoon. I'd like to again thank the staff for its indulgence and commend uh, the chairwoman of our committee and the ranking member. And I look forward to supporting their legislation, broadening our unified bipartisan national effort to stand strong against the tyranny and evil, tyranny and evil of this regime and for the welfare of innocent people throughout the world and throughout our country. Thank you very much. Gentleman yields. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomert, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the majority leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here on the floor to hear my friend from New Jersey's comments. Very well thought through and... Uh, I feel sure we could find some commonality in, in our concerns and appreciate the men's heart and mind. Thank you. One of the things that under the Debt Ceiling Act, uh, 
that was passed early August was a requirement for a vote on a balanced budget amendment. There's different versions of the balanced budget amendment. Um, one has most of the things we hold dear, not only requirement of balancing the budget, but also um, a cap on spending as a percentage of gross domestic product, and also uh, an increased supermajority in order to pass any tax bills, raising taxes. My concern has been that we, we had a wave election last November. We got over 80 new conservative freshmen, and we haven't cut spending like we should. I am more and more compelled that we need a cap on spending. Um, all of our members support that, um, but the question will be what version of a balanced budget amendment will come to the floor for a vote. And because I've become increasingly convinced this year to the point where we are now, um, Madam Speaker, I would request that uh, my name be removed as sponsor to H.J. Res. 2. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I, I really do appreciate uh, the comments of my friend from New Jersey, Mr. Andrews. <clears throat> There's a lot going on in the Middle East, and it's not looking very good for those who love freedom, the right to make their own choices, because you find in some of the documentation of those who have pushed, supported rebellion, the so-called Arab Spring, their definition of freedom is the, the freedom to live under Sharia law and be completely governed by Sharia law. That's the freedom that their Arab Spring brings. And it's been interesting. There's an article here from the Washington Examiner uh, by Gregory Kane. The title says, Obama becomes silent cow on Libya, Sharia. The article from Gregory Kane I'd uh, just like to read this the record. Uh, with each passing day, we're learning more and more about the people President Obama tossed us into bed with in Libya. Here's a headline from the London Daily Mail, a British newspaper. Quote, now the rebels impose Sharia law as Islamic rules become basic source of Libyan legislation. Unquote. In the story below the headline, readers learn from the chairman of Libya's National Transition Council that the country's new parliament will have an Islamist tent that, quote, any existing laws contradicting the teachings of Islam would be nullified, unquote, and that men will be allowed to have as many as four wives. Again, the question must be put to uh, President Barack Hussein American Values Obama, President of the United States, exactly how do Sharia law and polygamy reflect American values? Remember when, and I'm inserting President into uh, the mention of the President Obama, remember when President Obama justified American and NATO airstrikes in Libya to support the rebel forces that toppled the regime of Muammar Gaddafi, he claimed that preventing bloodshed was an, quote, American value, unquote. But there was bloodshed aplenty, at least on the side of Gaddafi forces. Gaddafi himself was a victim of the bloodshed, and the circumstances of his death that have come to light shed more light on what a sham President Obama's claim of acting to preserve American values really is. In a separate London Daily Mail story about Gaddafi's death, the paper printed the photo of an unidentified rebel who claimed he was the one who killed Gaddafi. Quote, we grabbed Gaddafi, unquote, the young man said. Quote, I hit him in the face. Some fighters wanted to take him away, and that's when I shot him twice in the face and in the chest, unquote. 
Later, it was revealed that more was done to Gaddafi than this young rebel merely shooting him in the face and chest. Some reports say that before he died, Gaddafi was sodomized with either a knife, bayonet, or some other sharp object. So let's recap. Number one, President Obama commits American forces as part of NATO, and I'll parenthetically add, when he did not have the sense to come before Congress and make the case here, as many of us on both sides of the aisle have been advocating, no matter who the president is, Republican, Democrat, if you can't come to Congress and make the case as to why American lives and American treasure should be put at risk, is it really something we ought to be doing as a country? Now, resuming with the article, again, President Obama commits American forces as part of NATO to, support, to supporting a rebel faction in Libya whose goal is to overthrow Gaddafi. President Obama does this while having absolutely no clue about what kind of people make up this rebel faction. Number two, the rebel forces prevail primarily through NATO airstrikes. It was NATO airstrike that took out Gaddafi convoy fleeing Serti that allowed rebel forces to capture the deposed Libyan leader. Number three, Gaddafi ends up in the hands of what can only be considered a mob. He is beaten, tortured, possibly sodomized, and fatally shot in what has been oxymoronically described as mob justice. His body is then put on public display in a meat store. Number four, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton flies into Libya and announces with the smug arrogance we might expect from an official from President Obama's administration, quote, we came, we saw, he, Gaddafi, died, unquote. Number five, leaders of Libya's National Transition Council announced that Sharia law will prevail in Libya. Number six, President Obama is mum on number five. He, President Obama, hasn't said one word about the blatantly false account of Gaddafi's death that interim Libyan Prime Minister Mahmoud Jabril initially gave reporters. He hasn't condemned the, quote, mob justice, unquote, that led to Gaddafi's death, the beating, the torture, the alleged sodomizing. He hasn't mumbled so much as a syllable about Gaddafi's body being put on display in a meat store. President Obama hasn't said one word about Sharia being the law of the land in the new Libya. The man who was unavoidable for comment when it came to justifying America's intervention in Libya has now pulled a complete Harpo Marx Act on this issue. Obama, President Obama, has made silent cow coolage look like a motor mouth. That's an article from Gregory Kane in the Washington Examiner. Then, interestingly, from the American Thinker, article by Andrew Bostom, Liberated Libya, Al-Qaeda flag aloft Benghazi's courthouse. The courthouse in Benghazi is the iconic seat of the revolt which toppled Gaddafi. Libya's, quote, immoral equivalent, unquote, to Egypt's Tahrir Square. During the tumultuous months of Libya's brutal civil war, it was here that rebel forces established a provisional government, propagandist media center, crowing to foreign journalists about their, quote, heroic, unquote, struggle for freedom. And here is a picture of the Al-Qaeda flag. The article goes on. One can now see both the Libyan rebel flag and the flag of Al-Qaeda fluttering atop Benghazi's courthouse. Got a blow-up of that right here. Just so those uh, who felt so compelled to assist 
members of Al-Qaeda. We knew there were members of Al-Qaeda. We didn't know how many were part of the Libyan rebel forces, but we knew there were members of Al-Qaeda. We knew that there were people who were rebelling against Gaddafi, that as much as they wanted to kill Gaddafi, want to kill Americans. And now we also know uh, NATO forces, as the president kept saying, oh, no, we're, we're, we're going to leave that to NATO forces. The United States military makes up 65% of NATO's military. It's American. So let's look and recap the good that we've done in supporting those members of Al-Qaeda who took out Gaddafi, with whom this administration had lawful dealings before they decided to support taking him out and hiding under NATO um, name, took action to see that he was thrown out and now killed, brutalized. So here we are, the Al-Qaeda flag flying over the courthouse in Benghazi. That's the daylight photo over here on this third. We have the nighttime photo, and once again, there is the Al-Qaeda flag waving proudly over that historic courthouse in Benghazi. Going back to the article from the American Thinker, according to one Benghazi resident, Islamists driving brand new SUVs and waving the black flag, Al -Qaeda, the black Al Qaeda flag, drive the city streets at night, shouting, "Quote, Islamia, Islamia, no east nor west." Unquote. A reference to previous worries that the country might or would be bifurcated between Gaddafi opponents in the east and the pro-Gaddafi elements in the West. El Hilwa adds these salient details. And then a long quote from, from El Hilwa. Earlier this week, I went to Benghazi Courthouse and confirmed the rumors. An Al-Qaeda flag was clearly visible. Its Arabic script declaring that, quote, there is no God but Allah, unquote, and a full moon underneath, when I tried to take pictures, a Salafi-looking guard wearing a green camouflage outfit rushed towards me and demanded to know what I was doing. My response was straightforward. I was taking a picture of the flag. He gave me an intimidating look and hissed, quote, Whomever speaks ill of this flag, we will cut off his tongue. How about that for an American value? I recommend you don't publish these. You will bring trouble to yourself, unquote. What glorious American values. Our president assured us that without the support of Congress, without even a debate in Congress, he had to rush headlong into helping these people that turns out, as we were concerned, might, Al-Qaeda. We had to help Al-Qaeda with whom we had declared war basically by the President of the United States after 9-11 because they had declared war on us. And so this President, without coming and having a debate, decides he's going to go help these people before he knew who all exactly we were helping because they reflect American values. Going back to the article, the author says, he followed me inside the courthouse, but luckily my driver, Khalid, was close by and interceded on my behalf. According to Khalid, the guard had angrily threatened to harm me. When I again engaged him in conversation, he told me, quote, this flag is the true flag of Islam, unquote. Well, how about those American values that our president used our treasure, put our military members at risk in order to effectuate. Now we've got the Al-Qaeda flag flying in Libya, in Benghazi, over the historic courthouse that was the headquarters during the assault on Gaddafi.
We found out on 9-11 there were people in the world who were at war with us, and it turns out they had been at war with us at least since Iran. Since those days when a naive but well-intentioned president named Carter had declared the Ayatollah Khomeini as a man of peace coming on. Same president who gave away the Panama Canal that so many valiant Americans lost their lives digging, creating, defending, was given away. There will be a price to pay for that at some point down the road by this country. But we're already paying the price and have been since 1979 for the administration at that time while I was in the Army of Fort Benning watching those things happen, knowing it was a crime for me as a military member to criticize anybody in the chain of command, which was President Carter. We had to bite our tongues as we watched that administration welcome in the Ayatollah Khomeini. So many lives have been lost. So many people tortured, killed. We've got Christians on the run all over the Middle East. Christians being killed around the Middle East. The last Christian church has now closed in Afghanistan that we sent American treasure and lives, lost so many American lives in order to rout the Taliban, and then we turned the country over to what the people there tell us is a very, very corrupt administration. Having met with leaders of the Northern Alliance, with a few other members of Congress, it's clear we have not done a good thing enforcing a centralized government in a, ca in a country that cannot sustain it without mass corruption and brutality. We also know from the recent comments of the Karzai himself, he's prepared to make peace and be an ally of people sworn to destroy us. Afghanistan can be salvaged, but it has, we have to be smart in the way that we do that. At the same time, we know that uh, more, more of the 9-11 hijackers were from Saudi Arabia than from any other country. It certainly appears that there are people in Saudi Arabia who have made massive amounts of money because of our dependence on their oil, who have used that money to fund terrorism that has been used against the United States to kill our precious men and women of our military. We need to become energy independent. We need to get rid of any department that has had as its avowed goal for 32 years to get off dependence on foreign energy and every year has done a poorer and poorer job of that. Although they have made some nice contributions for people at Solyndra and other um, bankrupt companies, it's time to get rid of the energy department. It's time to get serious about stopping the dependence on foreign energy. We know we've got enough natural gas. We can actually do that now. Have at least a hundred years of use of natural gas and I am fine taking a percentage of the royalties the federal government could get off natural gas produced, oil produced on our own land, our own federal land, and using it toward alternative energy. But I am not, as most of my friends here, are not in favor of borrowing more money to throw at companies like Solyndra that cannot make it on their own. Or like the, the solar company in Nevada, the friends of, of uh, leader Harry Reid, also getting massive money, 42, 44 cents of every dollar of which we had to borrow to throw at their friends who've gone bankrupt. 
it's time we started using some common sense. You don't rush in to help in a rebellion till you know who you're helping. And this administration did not do that because to think that they knew who we were helping is really unthinkable. That's my hope and prayer. This administration did not understand who it was helping that would one day fly Al-Qaeda flags over a building where housed government in Libya. And we have sat idly by and watched Iran grow greater and stronger in strength in its move toward creating nuclear weapons. Just as my Democratic friend from New Jersey was talking about, Iran getting closer and closer to having nuclear weapons, plural, Our strong ally in the Middle East, who is becoming surrounded by those who want to take it out, Israel is at threat for losing its very existence, an existence that was acknowledged and affirmed unanimously in the United Nations before it was taken over by people who sympathize with those who fly the Al-Qaeda flag. Back in those days, it was a unanimous decision. How could a country, a Jewish state like Israel, not be created after the worst genocide, Holocaust, in, in the history of man? They needed a country of their own. And what better place than in a place where King David ruled 1,400 years before there was a man named Muhammad, 14 year, 1,400 years before the creation of modern-day Islam. Well, I'm proud to say that Joel Rosenberg is a friend of mine was visiting with him last night. He's got a brand new book out. I can't wait to read it. Joel Rosenberg has an article in the Washington Times Friday, October 21st. It needs to be entered a record, and I'll do so by reading it. The headline, the title is Confronting the Threat from Iran. Joel Rosenberg writes, The brazen Iranian terrorist plot to assassinate the Saudi ambassador, kill Americans, and blow up the Saudi and Israeli embassies in Washington was a wake-up call. The radical regime in Tehran has crossed a red line. Iran has murdered Americans in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Lebanon over the years. Now it appears to have ordered terrorist attacks inside our nation's capital. Should this prove true, Iran has engaged in an act of war. Now the question is, who will neutralize the threat from Iran before the mullahs finish building nuclear warheads and the ballistic missile systems to l deliver them? Quote, the international community must stop Iran before it's too late, unquote. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warned in his United Nations speech last month, quote, If Iran is not stopped, we will all face the specter of nuclear terrorism, and the Arab Spring could soon become an Iranian winter. The world around Israel is definitely becoming more dangerous. Continuing the quote, Iran has not abandoned its nuclear program. The opposite is true. It continues full steam ahead, unquote, warned Major General Eisenberg, Home Front Command Chief for the Israeli Defense Forces, in a September speech. He warned that the Arab Spring could turn into a, quote, radical Islamic winter, unquote, and, quote, this raises the likelihood of an all-out total war with the possibility of weapons of mass destruction being used, unquote. The Obama administration is not taking decisive action to neutralize Iran. 
President Obama's policy of engagement with the mullahs has morphed into a policy of appeasement, and it has failed. Yet the White House has all but taken the use of force off the table. In September 2009, then-Defense Secretary Robert Gates said, quote, The reality is there is no military option that does anything more than buy time, unquote. In April 2010, the New York Times reported that Mr. Gates had, quote, warned in a secret three-page memorandum to top White House officials that the United States does not have an effective long-range policy for dealing with Iran's steady progress toward nuclear capability, unquote. Little has changed in the past 18 months. What's more, the administration is pressuring Israel not to launch a preemptive strike against Iran despite the growing th threat of a second holocaust. The American people, however, expect and deserve better. A bipartisan poll conducted in September by Democrat Pat Cadell and Republican John McLaughlin found that 77% of Americans think the Obama administration's current policies towards stopping Iran's nuclear program will fail. About 63% of Americans think Iran is the nation posing the greatest threat to us ahead of China and North Korea. Remarkably, 63% of Americans all approve of preemptive military action against Iran if economic sanctions do not stop its nuclear program. And they have not, and it is very clear, and I'm stating this parenthetically, it's not in the article. These sanctions have not slowed Iran from pursuing nuclear weapons. It appears very clear to those who look very long and study the issue very long that Iran is counting on developing nuclear weapons before the sanctions totally cripple them because they know when they get nuclear weapons, they can then use them to extort the removal of the sanctions. They will not work in time. It's time to face up to that. Going back to Joel Rosenberg's uh, article, war, of course, is not the preferred solution. There are a range of options a serious American president could take to neutralize the Iranian threat. But none of them is likely to work unless the president is willing to publicly put the military option on the table and order the Pentagon to accelerate planning for massive airstrikes and special operations. Will any of the Republican candidates for president step up? Articulating pro-growth economic policies is vital to the 2012 campaign, to be sure, but the GOP candidates must not drink the Kool-Aid that the economy is all that matters to the American people. To the contrary, anyone who is asking for the Republican nomination must articulate a clear, compelling, and detailed strategy for neutralizing the threat posed by the apocalyptic, genocidal death cult in Tehran. At the next debate, each of the Republican candidates for president should be pressed to directly answer the following questions. One, as President of the United States, what specific actions would you take to stop Iran from obtaining and deploying nuclear weapons and using terrorism to advance its Islamic re revolution? Number two, if you had intelligence that Iran was on the verge of building operational nuclear weapons, would your administration support an Israeli preemptive military strike on Iran's nuclear facilities? Number three, would you as president seriously consider ordering a preemptive strike by U.S. military forces to neutralize the Iranian nuclear threat? Former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney recently delivered a foreign policy address in South Carolina in which he raised the Iranian threat. Quote, will Iran be a fully activated nuclear weapon state, threatening its neighbors, uh, dominating the world oil supply with a stranglehold on the Strait of Hormuz? Unquote. Mr. Romney asked, in the hands of the Ayatollahs, a nuclear Iran is nothing less than an existential threat to Israel. Iran's suicidal fanatics could blackmail the world, unquote. Mr. Romney noted that he would, quote, begin discussions with Israel to increase the level of our military assistance and coordination, 
unquote, and would, quote, reiterate that Iran obtaining a nuclear weapon is unacceptable, unquote. However, he did not specifically discuss how he would stop Iran from getting the bomb and sponsoring terrorist attacks. Businessman Herman Cain has soared into the top tier of presidential candidates with a bold pro-growth tax implication plan, but he has spoken little of foreign policy. He has identified Iran as one of America's most serious national security threats and has been clear about his strong support for Israel. Drawing on his experience as a civilian contractor for the U.S. Navy working on ballistic missiles projects, Mr. Cain rightfully called has called for enhanced military or mil I'm sorry, missile defenses to blunt an Iranian nuclear threat. Quote, I would make it a priority to upgrade all of our Aegis uh, uh, surface air ballistic missile defense capabilities of all of our warships all the way around the world, unquote. Mr. Kane told the Values Voters Summit in Washington earlier this month, quote, make that a priority and then say to Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, make my day, unquote. His instincts are right, but missile defenses are insufficient to neutralize the Iranian threat. Few of the GOP candidates better understand the Iranian threat and the dangerous end times theology of the current Iranian leadership, which is preparing for the coming of the Shia Messiah known as the 12th Imam, than former Senator Rick Santorum of Pennsylvania. Thus far, however, he has not made Iran a major element of his campaign. Former House Speaker Newt Gingrich, Representative Michelle Bachman, Texas Governor Rick Perry have barely mentioned the issue, though certainly they understand the dangers. Only Representative Ron Paul among the Republican contenders doesn't grasp the seriousness of the twin Iranian threats of terrorism and nuclear weapons. Uh, quote, one can understand why the mullahs might want to become nuclear capable if only to defend themselves and be treated more respectfully, unquote, Mr. Paul has written. Congressman opposes economic sanctions on Iran. He opposes preemptive strikes on Iran. Indeed, Mr. Paul has indicated he does not have a problem with Iran acquiring nuclear weapons because he doesn't think the mullahs in Tehran would actually use such weapons against their enemies. What's more, he has stated that he would not come to Israel's defense if Iran fired nuclear weapons at the Jewish state. This article by Joel Rosenberg is an excellent article. And... He used to be taken seriously. Knowing Herman Cain personally, Governor Rick Perry personally, Shel Bachman personally, Rick Santorum personally, Newt Gingrich personally, I know they're all concerned about it, but because of the way the debates have been structured, this has not been an issue that's been pushed. And I know all of those individuals well enough to know their hearts and no, they do not want Iran to have nuclear weapons and will do what's necessary to prevent it. Trouble is, none of those individuals will become president or even have the chance to become president for 18 months. It's time that the American people convinced the American president who helped create the situation where Al-Qaeda flags our enemies our sworn enemies who want to destroy it. We helped them create the situation where they could fly their flags over the Libyan courthouse. That's more than a Libyan courthouse. It was the it was the brief capital, the headquarters for the people that this president chose to help. A dangerous time. Now I have filed House Resolution 271. It's got a slew of co-sponsors. They're all Republican, but I would hope that some of my friends on the other side of the aisle would join in with us on this. And, Madam Speaker, I would hope that uh, people would encourage their member of Congress to sign on if they support what's here. Basically, most of this resolution... It's not terribly long, just six pages, and most of that are whereas is stating facts. 
This resolution expressed support for the State of Israel's right to defend Israeli sovereignty, to protect the lives and safety of the Israeli people, and to use all means necessary to confront and eliminate nuclear threats posed by the Islamic Republic of Iran, including the use of military force, if no other peaceful solution can be found within reasonable time to protect against such an immediate existential threat to the State of Israel. Whereas archaeological evidence exists confirming Israel's existence as a nation over 3,000 years ago in the area in which it currently exists, despite assertions of its opponents, whereas with the dawn of modern Zionism, the national liberation movement of the Jewish people some 150 years ago, the Jewish people determined to return to their homeland in the land of Israel from the lands of their dispersion. Whereas in 1922, the League of Nations mandated that the Jewish people were the legal sovereigns over the land of Israel, and that legal mandate has never been superseded. Whereas in the aftermath of the Nazi-led Holocaust from 1933 to 1945, in which the Germans and their collaborators murdered six million Jewish people in a premeditated act of genocide, the international community recognized that the Jewish state, built by Jewish pioneers, must gain its independence from Great Britain. Whereas the United States was the first nation to recognize Israel's independence in 1948, and the state of Israel has since proven herself to be a faithful ally of the United States and the Middle East. Whereas the United States and Israel have a special friendship based on shared values and together share the common goal of peace and security in the Middle East. Whereas on October 20th, 2009, President Barack Obama rightly noted that the United States-Israel relationship is a, quote, bond that is much more than a strategic alliance, unquote. Whereas the national security of the United States, Israel, and allies in the Middle East face a clear and present danger from the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran seeking nuclear weapons and the ballistic missile capability to deliver them. Whereas Israel would face an existential threat from nuclear weapons armed Iran, Whereas President Barack Obama has been firm and clear in declaring United States opposition to a nuclear-armed Iran, stating November 7th of 2008, quote, let me state, repeat, what I stated during the course of the campaign, Iran's development of a nuclear weapon, I believe, is unacceptable, unquote. Whereas on October 26, 2005, at a conference in Tehran called World Without Zionism, Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad stated, quote, God willing, with the force of God behind it, we shall soon experience a world without the United States and Zionism, unquote. Whereas the New York Times reported that during his October 26, 2005 speech, President Ahmadinejad called for, quote, this occupying regime, Israel, to be wiped off the map, unquote. Whereas on April 14, 2006, Iranian President Ahmadinejad said, quote, Like it or not, the Zionist regime Israel is heading toward annihilation, unquote. Whereas on June 2, 2008, Iranian President Ahmadinejad said, quote, I must announce that the Zionist regime Israel, with a 60-year record of genocide, plunder, invasion, and betrayal, is about to die and will soon be erased from the geographical scene, unquote. Whereas on June 2nd, 2008, Iranian President Ahmadinejad said, quote, Today the time for the fall of the satanic power of the United States has come, and the countdown to annihilation of the emperor of power and wealth has started, unquote. Whereas on May 20th, 2009, Iran successfully tested a surface-to-surface long-range missile with an approximate range of 1,200 miles, whereas Iran continues its pursuit of nuclear weapons, whereas Iran has been caught building three secret nuclear facilities since 2002, whereas Iran continues its support of international terrorism, has ordered its proxy Hezbollah to carry out catastrophic acts of international terrorism, such as the bombing of the Jewish AMIA Center in Buenos Aires, Argentina, in 1994, and could give a nuclear weapon to a terrorist organization in the future, whereas Iran has refused to provide the International Atomic Energy Agency with full transparency and access to its nuclear program, 
Whereas United Nations Security Council Resolution 1803 states that according to the International Atomic Energy Agency, quote, Iran has not established full and sustained suspension of all enrichment-related and reprocessing activities and heavy water-related projects as set out in Resolution 1696 of 2006, 1737 of 2006, 1747 of 2007, nor resumed its cooperation with the IAEA under the additional protocol, nor taken the other steps required by the IAEA Board of Governors, nor complied with the provisions of Security Council Resolution 1696, 1737, and 1747. Whereas at July 2009's G8 summit in Italy, Iran was given a September 2009 deadline to start negotiations over its nuclear program, and Iran offered a five-page document lamenting the, quote, ungodly ways of thinking prevailing in global relations and including various subjects, but left out any mention of Iran's own nuclear program, which was the true issue in question. Whereas the United States has, be, has fully committed to finding a peaceful resolution to the Iranian nuclear threat and has made boundless efforts seeking such a resolution and to determine if such a resolution is even possible, whereas the United States does not want or seek war with Iran, but it will continue to keep all options open to prevent Iran from obtaining nuclear weapons, and whereas Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu said in January 2011 that a change of course in Iran will not be possible, quote, without a credible military option that is put before them by the international community led by the United States, unquote. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the House of Representatives, number one, condemns the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran for its threats of annihilating the United States and the state of Israel, for its continued support of international terrorism, and for its incitement of genocide of the Israeli people. Supports using all, number two, supports using all means persuading the government of Iran to stop building and acquire nuclear weapons. Number three, reaffirms the United States bond with Israel and pledges to continue work with the government of Israel and the people of Israel to ins ensure that their sovereign nation continues to receive critical economic and military assistance, including missile defense capabilities needed to address the threat of Iran. And number four, expresses support for Israel's right to use all means necessary to confront and eliminate nuclear threats posed by Iran, defend Israeli sovereignty, and protect the lives and safety of the Israeli people, including the use of military force, if no other peaceful solution can be found within a reasonable time. That's House Resolution 271, and I certainly hope that more members of Congress will join us in supporting that position because time is running out. It is also my hope and prayer that the rumors that have gone around about what this administration has told Israel behind closed doors do not have support in fact. That's my hope and prayer. Because if this administration were to be telling Israel behind closed doors that if they move to protect themselves against a nuclear attack by Iran without the United States permission, which would not be given, then Israel, since they do not have all of our stealth capability, do not have the most sophisticated bombs we have, will likely lose many planes and will be in need of replacement planes and parts. I hope and pray that the rumor that they're telling them we will not support them with replacement planes, replacement parts, if they defend themselves is not true. But this president, though he's been so vocal about why we needed to go support Libya, why it was in our American values interest, has not talked a lot about what he's telling Israel behind the scenes. Israel in, is in grave danger. We have been a friend because we believe in the same value of human life 
the same value of freedom, of liberty. We owe it to them, our friends, our allies. If we're not going to have the nerve to take action against a country that is sworn to be at war with us and to destroy us and take us out at all costs, then we should at least not stand in the way of a friend who wants to do so. I have a few more things I want to cover here. There's an article from National Review Online from the corner by Andrew McCarthy, another brilliant man and proud to say dear friend. The headline, Did Obama Appointee Access Confidential Database in Effort to Smear Perry as Islamophobe? At PJM, terrorism researcher Patrick Poole reports that Mohammed Ali Biari, an appointee of President Obama's Homeland Security Advisory Council, is in hot water with the Texas Department of Public Safety. The issue is whether Ali Biari used his privileged access to state a law enforcement that, or access a state law enforcement database to acquire intelligence reports and then tried to shop them to the media, urging they showed rampant Islamophobia at Texas Department of Public Safety under Governor Rick Perry. Poole says no story was published because, according to one press source, there was, quote, nothing remotely resembling Islamophobia, unquote, in the leaked reports. The source told Poole, quote, I think El Biari was hoping we would bite and not give it too much of a look in light of other media outfits jumping on the Islamophobia bandwagon, unquote. The Islamophobia bandwagon was the subject of my column last week. Seems there are plenty of Islamists and leftists climbing aboard. El Biari, you'll no doubt be stunned to learn, was also on President Obama's DA, Department of Homeland Security Working Group on the, quote, countering violent extremism. That's the brain trust that helped devise the new Obama counterterrorism strategy I outlined a few weeks back. The one that envisions having law enforcement pare back their intelligence gathering activities and take their marching orders from, quote, community partners, unquote. I call the new strategy factophobia. As noted by Poole in the investigative project on terrorism, LBRE's history includes an appearance at a conference honoring Ayatollah Khomeini, condemning the Justice Department's successful prosecution of a Hamas financing conspiracy designed by the Muslim Brotherhood in the Holy Land Foundation case, praise for Brotherhood theorist Saeed Qutb, and, a, and an aggressive email exchange with Rod Dreyer in 2006, where Dreyer at the uh, Dallas Morning News countered Elibiari's praise for Qutb, in which Elibiari reportedly called Dreyer, quote, a Klansman without a hood, unquote, and warned him, quote, treat people as inferiors and you can expect someone to put a banana in your exhaust pipe or something, unquote. Who better could President Obama possibly choose to help formulate counterterrorism strategy? Actually, once you read the strategy, I think you'll agree he made a perfect choice. And we have another article from National Review Online, headline, Again, from Andrew McCarthy, Napolitano, on El Biari, I know nothing, I know nothing. He said that Secretary Napolitano professes not to know anything about the matter, talking about El Biari, or about how a guy who appears at a conference honoring Ayatollah Khomeini, who praises Muslim Brotherhood theorist Saeed Khatab, and who condemns the Justice Department's successful prosecution of the Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhoods, a mosque financing network in the Holy Land Foundation case, somehow winds up on the Department of Homeland Security Advisory Council that helped devise the Obama administration's counterterrorism policy. Actually, it um, turns out, as Secretary Napolitano testified, uh, that actually she... Uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security gave this gentleman the secret security clearance, which ultimately allowed him to access sensitive documents, at least two or three of which he downloaded and then tried to market to major media sources. 
I think it is important to note that in the pleading that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed filed, he's a very smart man. He may be crazy, but he is a very smart man. Did his own interpretation in English, so some of the articles are not quite appropriate, but it's he sets out a legal document and justifies all the actions he took in working on 9-11's murder of 3,000 Americans. He takes verses from the Quran and uses them to justify his actions. At one point in his pleading, which we have access to through our website, this was uh, declassified for the, by the judge in the 9-11 case involving five planners of 9-11. It was ordered released on the ninth day of March 2009. And there are also transcripts of his um, colloquy with the judge in which he confessed to many other acts of terrorism quite voluntarily, it was obvious. But in his pleading, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, on behalf of himself and the four other defendants who were ready to plead guilty, announced they were pleading guilty before this administration and the Attorney General-to-be, uh, Eric Holder, announced they were going to give these guys a show trial in New York so they withdrew their guilty pleas there so they could get a show trial in New York. Now, that's not going to happen. And now it looks like four years after these people agreed to plead guilty, which will be December of next year, they will still not have been tried because of the actions of this administration. But Khalid Sheikh Mohammed says, We do not possess your military might not your nuclear weapons. Nevertheless, we fight you with the Almighty God. So if our act of jihad and our fighting with you cause fear and terror, then many thanks to God, because it is Him that has thrown fear into your hearts, which resulted, he says in, he meant from, your infidelity, paganism, and your statement that God had a son and your trinity beliefs. Then he goes on and he says, God stated in his book, verse 151, Al-Umrah, Soon shall we cast terror into the hearts of the unbelievers, for that they join companies with Allah, for which he has sent no authority. Their place will be the fire, and evil is the home of the wrongdoer. That's just one part. He, he also says, we ask to be near God. We fight you, destroy you, terrorize you. You will be greatly defeated in Afghanistan and Iraq, and America will fall politically, militarily, economically. Your end is very near, and your fall will be just the fall of the towers on the blessed 9-11 day. Uh, but this gentleman references that one of the reasons it's okay to kill Americans is because you know, many Americans believe there is a Holy Trinity, a Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. They believe that God had a son that Christians call the Messiah. My time is running out, so let me just direct Madam Speaker to the Treaty of Paris, 1783. Such a historic document. The most powerful country in the world at that time 1783 was Great Britain. They had had the most powerful navy, the most powerful military, and yet a ragtag bunch of people who believed so firmly in the ideas of freedom and being able to practice most of them. In fact, a third of the signers of the Declaration weren't just Christians, over a third, they weren't just Christians. They, as Martin Luther King Jr., were ordained Christian ministers. And they believed in freedom and that God was giving us a chance to govern ourselves. So after this ragtag bunch defeated the strongest country in the world, Great Britain, and they sat down in 1783 in Paris, 
And we had there on our behalf John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and John Jay, three of our brightest minds. They had to set about figuring out what can we put on paper to have Great Britain sign that will be so important that they would not want to risk violating an oath. What kind of oath could we put on this treaty that Great Britain would be scared to violate? This treaty will want them to recognize the United States of America. What could we, what could we do to make it serious enough that they would not turn around the next month and say we had no right to be independent despite what they signed? There is a, an original copy of the Treaty of Paris in the State Department. Tours can be taken. I've taken tons of tours around Washington, D.C. until my pastor and his wife, David and Cindy Dykes, uh, were in town years back. I had not seen that. But I was taken aback, and I've got a copy of, this is a duplicate, of the Treaty of Paris, two pages. Well, it's the first and last page here. Apparently it says um, there's ten articles, so we've got the first and last pages here. So how would you start a treaty in such a way that it would scare the strongest country in the world from violating their oath? Well, they figured it out. And they put it on the document, the biggest letters anywhere in the treaty are those in the first two lines, and they began, in the name of the most holy and undivided trinity. Starting the Treaty of Paris within the name of the most holy and undivided trinity they knew would be strong enough to scare Great Britain into not violating the oath that they signed on that document. Then you tie it in with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's pleading. The very fact that they would sign such a document recognizing the Holy Trinity, according to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and his interpretation of the Quran, that's justification for killing and terrorizing people that believe in the holy undivided trinity. There's a war going on, and in Libya apparently we fought for people who want to destroy us. The Al-Qaeda flag now flies proudly over this federal building in Benghazi, Libya. Congratulations to this administration for making that happen. With that, Madam Speaker, I yield back.